Feast TV is brought to you with the support from Missouri Wines, Callie's Coffee, Old Time Produce, and the Raphael Hotel. Today, we are heading south. I'm Kat Neville, and this is Feast TV. When you want a taste of something rich and tangy and satisfying all at the same time, where should you go? You should head south, and I mean way south, to Central, South America, and the Caribbean. Our first stop in this episode is at Mission Taco. They make their own masa fresh every single day from their central grocery here in St. Louis. Let's check it out. Today we are at our commissary and corporate offices for Mission Taco Joint, where we make the masa for the tortillas. So my brother Adam and I came up with this concept about five years ago to make fresh tacos, amongst other things, and great drinks, and a really fun environment. We grew up in California a little bit, and we really know what great Mexican food could be. So we took kind of that concept and mixed it with unique ingredients and a lot of fun. So when we first opened the first store in Del Mar, we had no idea it would grow this fast. Currently we have five Mission Taco joints and a food truck and a full catering line. And we're super excited about the growth, obviously, and uh, we look forward to the future. So the two different ways to make tortillas fresh is, one, you can buy corn flour in the store. It's a little five pound bag called Maseca. And it's basically cooked corn that's been dried out and ground down into a flour. And basically all you do to that is add water, rehydrate it, and make a dough. What we're doing is we're taking fresh kernel corn that we get right over in Illinois, Rovi Seed Company. We cook that with food grade lime and let it soak overnight to remove the outer layer of the corn. It's called nixtamalization, pretty traditional thing they do in Mexico. And after that, we grind it through volcanic stones. When we grind the corn, we control a bunch of things. We control the flavor, the color, the elasticity, and the water content. How much masa are you making every day? 500 pounds. And what is that the equivalent of? So it's 500 pounds of corn, dry corn. After we soak it and cook it, it about doubles in weight. So it's roughly 1,000 pounds of masa. A dry piece of corn is probably half the size of this. Yeah. This has been cooking and steeping overnight. When it's dry, it really has no color to it. Once it's cooked down, you get the nice brown and yellow into the white at the top and then also that outer layer that all shuds off. So the dried corn is dumped into the cooker right. and then you add the food grade lime. What is lime exactly? It's calcium hydroxide and it just assists with taking that outer layer off the corn. And so you get it up to like a simmer. 160 degrees. Then we turn the heat off, give it a good stir and it steeps overnight. It's such a simple process, but it really changes the corn. Yeah, and there's a lot of different variables that go into it. It's taken me about two years to learn how to do it. The cooking of the corn is the easy part. The grinding and getting the right amount of water going through it and all that, that's the tough part. And you actually do have volcanic stones in the grinder. The grooves, they kind of radiate out from the center. Can you right. kind of tell me how that works? So in the center, the grooves are pretty large, and that's what sucks the corn in between the stones. And then as it moves through the stones, they get tighter and the grooves get much smaller. And that's how you get that fine ground masa. And so how do you control the grind? And there's a few things. The amount of water you have going through, the amount of corn you have going through, and how tight you have the stones. And so when you're making tortillas for tacos, are you looking for something different than if you're making like a masa for some other application or is it all the same? Yeah, I would say like tamale masa would be a much coarser grind. Um, with tortillas it has to be pretty fine or else they won't form correctly.
watched this corn be ground, and it was a really quick process. It took, what, five, 10 minutes? Yeah, we did a small batch this time. Generally, it takes about half an hour, 40 minutes to do. But that's for 500 pounds. Yeah, right. And this is only 100 pounds that we did right, right. today. This is the tortilla press. Right. And so all you do is you take this masa, masa. you just run it through, and you just make your you tortillas. Come out with, yeah, your pre-cut tortilla. And then so each restaurant, they make their own fresh every day. Yeah, so every restaurant has one of these machines in-house that they have a person dedicated to sitting there and rolling tortillas and cooking them all day. So we've seen how the fresh masa is made now. Let's head over to the original location of Mission Taco Joint for a taste of their tacos and empanadas. So as we just saw from the folks at Mission Taco, masa, which is an incredibly simple ingredient, is the basis of so much of what we love about Mexican cuisine. And we also have a love for Cuban cuisine here in the States. So next up, we are going to stop in with the folks at Plantain District in Kansas City. They have mastered the art of the Cuban sandwich, which layers pickles, mustard, and ham. Check it out. I'm Rachel, and I'm one of the owners of Plantain District. We're a Cuban food truck here in Kansas City, and we've been open since 2014. My husband and I were actually at an area local eatery, and we had a Cuban sandwich, and uh, we honestly thought that we could do a better job. From that conversation to actually purchasing a truck was about four weeks. So we had really good food coming out of our truck and at the same time, we also were able to organize, manage it well, get to all the big events, book a lot of weddings and that type of thing. My partners are Wanda Burke and Matthew Putroff. So basically, uh, I usually try to stay out of the whole food creative process part of it. I stick to the business side of it. Uh, Wanda and Matthew are infinitely more talented than I am in that area. Right now we're in my home kitchen and we are playing and testing new ideas for our concept that's going to be launching in the next few months. So right now we're just in a testing phase, but we're excited about what's coming up and where Plantain District is going. The reason we decided that we wanted to move and transition from a food truck to a container is it still has the feel of a food truck. We're used to working in smaller confined spaces, but at the same time, it removes the mobility out of that. And so people know where to find us when they want to come and get Cuban sandwiches. As a food truck, we really loved getting together with other food trucks and providing basically like a food atmosphere, right? Where variation of foods, bring your friends, come stop by. When the container launches, we're gonna be in North Kansas City, because right now North Kansas City's booming. They're creating basically like an entertainment district right now. And so our idea is to almost have an outdoor food court. So we would be one of a few containers set up. Cuban sandwiches are one of the most known things, especially here in Kansas City. But we also do rice and beans, we do lechon, which is shredded pork. We do ropa vieja, we do picadillo. A really common misconception with Cuban food is that it's spicy. It's actually not spicy at all. The three ingredients usually starting off everything, it's gonna be garlic, citrus, and olive oil. So um, people are usually surprised when they come and eat Cuban food and we explain to them that it's not spicy food, it's really easily handled by most palates. A plantain is very much like a banana, except it has to be cooked. You don't ever want to eat a plantain raw. And there's a ton of ways to make plantain. So we love to do plantain chips because it goes really well with the Cuban sandwich. 
We were a little limited in the food truck with what we could do with the plantain, but in the container we would have not only physically more room, but more kitchen equipment that we would be able to work with. We can literally just put plantains all over the place. <laughs>
people order sometimes here at the restaurant can't just have uh, a glass of leche de tigre. This is amazing. It's supposed to like wake you up. And it's just kind of like it's so sharp, you know. It's really complex. It's delicious. Now we have our leche. We're gonna make our ceviche. Okay. Ceviche is the flagship of Peru. You get to show the freshest ingredients done in a very, very simple way, and it's just delicious. Let's plate it up. I like to do some sweet potatoes. Kind of like balances the acidity and the spiciness of the ceviche. And that's our ceviche. Sergio, this is gorgeous, thank you. The best way to eat ceviche, always with a spoon. So you get a little bit of leche, nice. a little bit of the fish, and some sweet potato, and you just kind of like eat it up. Oh, I love it. It's like perfect summer dish, perfect hangover cure, just because it's got so much <laughs> flavor into it. You know, it wakes you up. Cure yourself with some ceviche? Yes, absolutely. I love it. Lomo Sotao is a stir-fried dish, and it has some Asian influence into it from China, uh, using the soy, using the wok, using high flames to season the meat, and then you throw in some tomatoes, some onions, some pisco in there, and then some ahi amarillos and chilies in there, and it just kind of like blends into this wok. I think it's probably like the most popular and most loved dish from like in Peru. Like every Peruvian loves lomo saltado, and they will tell you stories story? about it, like how their mom makes the best lomo saltado, or their <laughs> grandma makes the best lomo saltado. Capchi is a roasted potato with a queso fresco sauce on the bottom. Uh, it's traditionally eaten in the mountains in the Andes, and it has some cancha, which is dried Peruvian corn, some purple potatoes, Peruvian potatoes. I've been coming to Mango for years, yeah. and when I came in to have dinner just a few months ago, uh -huh. the dishes that you brought out were so vibrant and so unique. And it was a flavor of Peru that I had never had before. Yes. And it's exciting to see you really working with local farmers and indigenous ingredients to bring true authenticity to the menu. The goal is to make really good Peruvian food. <laughs> well, I think your goal has been achieved and now I think it's time to eat. <laughs> So we've had a taste of Mexico, Cuba, and Peru. Next up, we're gonna head to the kitchen and cook up some Brazilian street food. Come with me. So when I originally came up with an idea for what to make for this episode, I was thinking about Mexican food, but then I stopped myself and I went a little bit further south, actually a lot further south to Brazil. And today I'm going to make a very traditional bean fritter that is stuffed with a shrimp salad. And this is a very typical street food that you find in Brazil. It's gonna be relatively easy to make. There are a lot of ingredients, but it's not complicated. The most complicated thing, to be honest, is dealing with the beans. So you start off with two cups of black-eyed peas and you soak them for a few hours. You wanna pulse them in a food processor just to kind of break them up. And then you soak them for a bit and the skins will start to come off. And so the trick with this is making sure that you are patient and you kind of skim all of the skins from the top of the water. It takes a little bit of time, but it's not difficult. So I have my soaked and skinned black-eyed peas into the food processor. I'm gonna add in a roughly chopped onion. This is only half an onion, so I'm gonna add about half of this one, but they're pretty big. Just add in a couple of garlic cloves. Put in a good amount of salt. Now I'm just gonna process these until they form a nice thick paste. Okay, that looks terrific. And it smells really good. It's a really interesting way 
to use beans. And if you notice, they're still raw. So if you're looking for fun ways to work some beans into your diet, this would be one of them. I'm just gonna turn this into a nice big bowl and then I'm gonna stir it for a few minutes so that it's aerated. Then we're gonna fry them up. Now we're gonna make the fritters. I just have some neutral oil that I've been heating and I'm gonna drop this bean mixture by spoonfuls and just fry them up until they're nice and golden brown. the word bean fritter and think that these might be like hockey pucks, but they are super light and fluffy. It's a really surprising way to use beans, which is exactly why I'm doing this recipe for my demo. So my fritters are finished, and right now I'm just peeling this knob of ginger. I love the South American approach to food because it really is very international. Like we just saw at Mango Peru, all the different flavors and cultures have combined to make a really vibrant and beautiful cuisine. And the same is true for Brazil. So much like a lot of the other countries down in Central and South America, there is this international influence on the food. So in this particular dish, you're seeing things like tomatoes, which obviously are native to the Americas. And we also are using dried shrimp, which if you've never had these little guys before, they're pungent. And it is something that is very traditional in Southeast Asian cuisine, kind of like fish sauce. It adds that umami that you just can't quite put your finger on. We're gonna be using peanuts and cashews and dried chilies. It's a really wonderful and complex dish. If you're looking for the recipe with all of the ingredients, go to feastmagazine.com. In the Feast TV section of the site, you're gonna find all the recipes there. In goes the ginger. Got my dried shrimp. I'm gonna add in fried peanuts, cashews. I'm gonna chop up a couple of scallions here. Drop those in. I'm gonna put in a few of these dried chilies. And these are chilies de arbol. If you can't find them, you can use another kind of chili, but this is gonna be the right and authentic flavor. A couple cloves of garlic, lots of garlic today here in the Feast TV kitchen. I'm gonna go ahead and chop up everything that's going to go into the saute pan, which is my onion as well as cilantro and parsley. Tomatoes and then my shrimp. I'm gonna process this into a paste and then I'm heading over to the stove and I'm gonna start cooking. So in here, I have a bit of coconut oil and once it heats up, I'm gonna go ahead and fry up this amazing shrimp paste. I'm gonna add in my onion. Now in go the shrimp and tomatoes. in this bowl is a cup of stale bread that's been mashed up with a can of coconut milk. And the coconut milk that I used for this is a little bit creamier than your average. It's more like a coconut cream, but it's gonna add a whole bunch of richness to this wonderful shrimp salad. And then the bread is going to help bind everything together. Let that simmer for just a little bit. I'm gonna add in some salt, and then I will throw in my cilantro and my parsley. This is one of those dishes in Brazil where everybody has their own version. It's a very common street food, 
but it's made in vastly different ways across the country. All right. I think we are just about there. I wanna make sure that I don't overcook the shrimp, so I'm gonna go ahead and turn off the heat, then we're gonna go stuff those fritters. So just to finish this up, very simple. You're just going to take a sharp knife and split open your fritter, and you're going to just stuff some of that wonderful shrimp salad inside. Could not be easier. The fritters are crunchy and crispy on the outside and super fluffy and tender on the inside. And this shrimp salad is spicy and rich. And because of the dried shrimp, it's a little bit kind of funky. It's wonderful, wonderful stuff. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm, that's good. So the perfect wine to pair with this is Traminette. Now Traminette, is another one of the hybrid grapes that grows really, really well in Missouri. This one happens to be from Teravox, which is near Weston, Missouri. It's a very interesting winery. They experiment with all kinds of Native American grapes. And Traminette is a floral white wine. It does have some acidity to it, but it's really marked by kind of a flowery, almost rose-like characteristic. So it's gonna go beautifully with the spice and that seafood dried shrimp kind of a funkiness that this salad has. This is a really complex dish and having an equally complex white wine to go with it will be the perfect pair. So cheers. Thanks for going south with me. Mm -hmm.